Why did you kindly agree to speak to me today? <clears throat> well, partly because you were so polite and asked so nicely, <laughs> and partly, as you know, people will know we have a bit of history. Mm -hmm. um, so after you contact me about the joke I made, or actually probably wasn't about the joke so much as the way I dealt with the criticism online yeah. with the joke, <clears throat> which was a little bit crass, a little bit, a little bit dismissive, and a little bit cold. So I then met with you, mm -hmm. and mainly I met with you, well, partly because you were very reasonable as well, which is unusual as you mm. probably know. Yeah. You know, normally people, especially if they have access to you via Twitter or something, their first response yeah. is to say, essentially, you know, put in whatever word you want, but it's abusive. Mm. And then you just think, well, why should I engage with you? Because yeah. you've immediately gone to the extreme of like, I'm a monster. So, yeah. And the fact that you didn't do that, and the fact that we have a friend in common, mm -hmm. an acquaintance really, you know her better than me probably, but I've always liked her a lot, is um, the legendary Roz. Mm. As you said earlier, now 103. <laughs> Which is what you said, I as a joke. That. I've been shamed. What you said last time was really interesting about the fact that you felt that you could have got away with it, so to speak. Well, during the conversation we had, you came to see me and we talked about the joke I made online, which was a fairly old-fashioned, sort of not really 70s, more 80s joke yeah. about transsexuals and the idea of being the cock as a kind of hidden, almost taboo part of the joke to play off of. But a kind yeah. of, a kind of, you know, um, because everyone knows the nature of what you're talking about, then uh, the kind of mainstream audience will still respond to that. Mm -hmm. Because regardless of where the cock is attached, mm -hmm. still using a cock, it's a bit like kind of a fart or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's always been more acceptable than going the vagina route anyway. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, that, that was it. So anyway, I made that joke on, on air and, you know, then someone came to me and I thought, oh my God, they're really overreacting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I then made a kind of worse comment back. And then you came to see me, and, and while we were talking, A, as I said, you know, I liked you and I liked the, the, the way you approached me, which was very... Um, uh, not compromising in any way, but at the same time very kind of straightforward and very like, okay, look, this is what we're about. We think you could benefit from listening to us. Mm -hmm. um, so you came in and while we were talking, I'd already realised that, as you know, obviously I have some sort of form as being a kind of controversial figure, never intentionally, but especially the sex gay thing. And ever since that happened, the newspapers seem to uh, see me as someone who it's very easy to write a story about mm -hmm. if it is in any way seen as provoking or upsetting anyone. Mm -hmm because that's kind of the, it's almost like they, they, they write a narrative for you. And as long as you stick to that narrative, or as long as they can find a way of making something work to that narrative, they'll return to it. Because yeah. of course, I suppose the thing is, the audience already think he's an arsehole. He's just said something else to this group making an arsehole, let's, mm -hmm. let's make sure we can fill a page with that. Now the fact that no one picked up on the joke, more crucially the response to the joke, and the fact that online there were quite a few people saying he can't get away with this, Why, when are people going to learn not to make these jokes and so on. The fact that none of the mainstream press sort of were interested made me therefore feel much more interested mm -hmm. in your point of view. Mm -hmm. Because okay, I'm an easy target for them, I know they don't like me. Here they had an opportunity to beat me up again, and I hope that doesn't sound grand or arrogant. I don't mean they're looking for me, oh they want to put me in the papers, but I know that that's an easy thing they could reach for. Uh, here's an opportunity because he's obviously upset a group of people, however small, but it's a group of people. Oh, but you know what? Let's not worry about that. I thought it was more telling mm -hmm. to me the fact that it didn't get reported, didn't get picked up on in any way. Mm -hmm. And so that made me realise, I think what I said at the time, I said I realised that, you know, genuinely, I think you were speaking to me on behalf of a group that I would consider to be a genuine and one of the few last genuine minority groups. Mm -hmm. You know, because every other, what we once referred to as a minority group, have either mobilised or politicised themselves or got their message out there to the extent where although in actual terms of you know just numbers they would still be considered a minority because they don't represent a kind of majority voice at the same time they're not really a minority because they're wielding a certain amount of power yeah. that those who actually control the media and so on and so forth do feel they have to at least listen to or respond to or report and at the moment you don't mm. you know so that that was all the more reason I thought for me wanting to carry on with the dialogue why do you think it is because we've come a really long way in terms of accepting gay people, haven't we? Why do you think people struggle so much with the whole transgender thing? Why is it even an issue? Well, because I think, I mean, I think there, you know, there are probably twenty different answers to that. Realistically, you know, there isn't. If there was one simple answer, if it was people were threatened, you could say, well, they're threatened. It isn't that they're threatened, but some are obviously. Mm -hmm. It isn't that they're curious, although some are. It isn't that they're repressed about it and wish to know more, but are embarrassed, but some probably are. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if we look at the kind of the move of gay rights, as I understand it, and I'm speaking, of course, from a position of incredible ignorance. Yeah. Being are you? 
Well, yeah, because I'm a straight middle class now, you know, I was working class. But when I was growing up, gay people didn't exist, mm. interestingly, in that I didn't know any gay people, I never met any gay people. <clears throat> There, was n there were no gay people on TV apart from cuddly camp people, mm -hmm. and it wasn't explicit. The sexuality was kind of a, 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 a superficial adornment, like Larry Grayson, and, you know, yeah. and all, it was all that. Yeah. And those were the jokes you saw on TV about gay mm -hmm. people. But even as a child, I didn't know what it meant. And, and when I first uh, understood the mechanics of gay sex, I was terrified. <laughs> You know, because I didn't know that anyone could do that with anyone, gay or straight. You know, it's like, what? Yeah. You put it where? When? Yeah. You know, but I was still very confused about heterosexual, uh, okay. the physics of heterosexual lovemaking until I was about 17 anyway. So um, so it was a diff very different world. It is interesting the way that the media changed. And I think it was, you know, aggressive. It was a kind of aggressive policy of, you know, um, educating people and mm -hmm. being militant mm -hmm. and not letting things slide that occurred really, I guess, from the mid 80s onwards. Yeah, I would guess, and that's what it strikes for me. You know, in the UK, and I remember being aware of it when I was at university, and then thinking, "Oh, I see. Okay, oh, they have it's okay." Well, first of all, I was amazed that they were open about it because once again, I'd grown up with it being, and this is the interesting. You know, it, it was an underground thing. Yeah, not through choice, of course, because yeah. it, you know it only been kind of legally allowed from the sixties. But it was an underground thing, and then they were having a voice, and then it was like, okay, gay pride, and you became aware of that, and. And then you began to see comedians responding. Interestingly, the fact that we're having this conversation well, mm -hmm. to it in a way where they were no longer making the same jokes about it. Yeah. So it, by the by the from eighty to eighty three onwards, when that kind of alternative comic boom had happened, yeah. you wouldn't get people coming on and oh, you know, and yeah. you actually got gay comics on stage. And although they were initially, at least, it was almost always they were making jokes about themselves or their lifestyles or the kind of yeah. difference yeah. between their lifestyle and the kind of perceived mainstream heterosexual lifestyle. They were still at the same time, it was radical yeah. because they weren't coming on from a position of embarrassment or mocking themselves. Mm. It's a, once again, it's a bit like race. You know, you look at the kind of, you know, in the 60s, comedy about race on TV was aimed at, you know, there's someone who's a different colour and their food smells funny mm. or they have different lifestyle habits to us or they're doing this or they're doing that. You know, there were these broad, rather cruel generalisations. Yeah. Uh, and then it became, no, it's not okay anymore. And then we look back on the comics who were still doing that material and thought, ooh, and that was from the alternative. Mm. How come you're still doing that? Yeah. And I suppose to an extent, but see, the problem is, you know, I'm saying, uh, not the problem, but because genuinely you're a minority, there aren't as many jokes being made about transgender people as there were being made about gay people in the 70s, yeah. probably. Yeah. So therefore, it, it, once again, it's not quite as easy, I think, for people who might be on your side to say, well, you have a point. Yeah. Because maybe they don't encounter it. Obviously, you're yeah. attuned to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a network of people who say, have you heard this? Have you seen yeah. this? But but it, there isn't quite the onslaught or the wave of 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 you know sort of negativity. I know you yeah. you receive a lot of it, yeah. but you're probably much more aware of it than than people were. Because I was aware that it was gay humour was a thing yeah. on TV, yeah. and uh, I'm not aware. You know, maybe there'll be you know, I know there's a, a at least a couple of transgender comedians out there. Maybe mm. one of them will break through or get a bigger platform, and that will be a, a turning yeah. point in that. Area. I guess what I wanted to ask you, why why do you think people find it funny? Do you think it's just they feel a bit awkward or they don't understand it? Why why well, do people know, find it funny? Because they do, don't but they? There are different jokes made about it. I mean, sometimes people like pointing out. I know you mentioned to me Stephen Fry did a thing where he went, "Oh, you can always tell it's the hands, darling," or something. Yeah. You think, okay, what's what? Why is that getting the response it is? Well, it's kind of getting the response. I guess there's an element of, oh, good, that's a taboo thing out in the open. Mm. Um, or and oh good maybe there is a thing where maybe you have noticed someone who actually is more masculine than you would normally expect a woman to be and therefore has some trait and therefore you couldn't mention it before you couldn't say anything at the time but it you noticed it and therefore it's in, oh good I can laugh about it and let it out it might be as simple as that it might not be a, a vicious thing it might just be that they didn't know how to deal with it when confronting someone for the first time or seeing someone mm. because I think that's a lot of the issue you know you said why are people why is it such a thing and I think it's still, it's, and it's getting more out in the open because there are documentaries, yeah. you know, a yeah, number. Yeah. You, and you, once again, you would know more about me. I was just talking about the Ladyboy thing that I was watching yeah. at home with the kids. Mm. And, and you think, okay, most of them now do, don't approach it as a kind of freak show, as a kind of, mm. I'm sure some people are just there because there's a prurience and a kind yeah. of a voyeuristic interest. But a lot of them seem to be handled very sensitively. And, mm -hmm. and when you see a person going through the challenges involved in, mm. in you know, becoming the person that they are, then you realise, oh, hold on, this is a tough life. Yeah. And it's difficult yeah. the way. And, and you often see, for example, someone uh, encountering abuse or yeah. talking about <clears throat> the abuse they've 
faced and and uh, unless you're a very kind of cold person then you will respond to that yeah and, and that's coming out more in the open now yeah you know and it wasn't before previously it would have been like those channel five shows you know the boy with three faces or something yeah, yeah. it would have been presented as such an anomaly such a weird thing yeah you know we were talking before we started about you know some people who get a bit addicted to surgery yeah and that's you know and that's not just a transgender thing obviously there are people that and you think that's always going to be something when someone's had a little bit too much surgery when they've had obvious surgery regardless of the reason that's something that people will notice mm. and not know how to deal with yeah we don't know how to deal with it. you see someone who's had too much off the nose or too much and the faces that you know it's like that there's that woman the american one joyce wilderstein or something like yeah. that you know you've got the classic surgery cat look yeah. from somebody who started in the 70s before they yeah. were, and, too, and if you were to see her in the street you would look twice you would yeah. be and you would and that's human nature yeah that kind of curiosity or that shock of when you deal with something you don't quite expect to see and then you see it there and i think that so there's that element involved and yeah. then there's the kind of what's seen as like the ickiness of it yeah anything to do with genitalia yeah i think a lot of people find it difficult talking about yeah you know yeah. and especially if it involves surgery in genitalia yeah it's a huge shock to people that you know that someone would find it and and also there's the kind of I think the knee-jerk casual response is that why would you want to do that because it's still so ingrained in people's heads that if you got a cop you're a man yeah right and taking off ain't going to change that in yeah. their head yeah uh, in, in and I believe this probably to be true once again it might be a generalization I've made up but I get the feeling that's the case but I think the more we see on TV mm. and the more openly that's discussed the older no it isn't the case and you mm. see people going through that and you realize that they're aware of the normative of what they're doing yeah. and they're also aware that you know, that's what they need to do when you see that you think oh I see I get it now it's education it's as simple as that it's mm. learning you know it's like Normally we mock or we joke to a kind of way of dealing with what we fear or what we don't understand or what we're threatened by. You know, so people are threatened by people from a different colour moving to this country in the 50s and 60s. Mm. So we make jokes about it. So we can all laugh about it. So it's not a threat because we were just all laughing at that. Yeah. You know, and sometimes that's a good safety valve for society. Sometimes it's a bad thing because it does perpetuate certain stereotypes. It does perhaps enable people to feel more comfortable with their bullying, although I personally disagree with that theory when that gets put forward because I don't think people bully because they hear a joke and think, oh, it's okay for me to say this. I think they bully because they've been brought up incorrectly. Mm. And maybe after the event, but you know, I've never wanted to bully someone even if I've laughed at a joke about them. You know what I mean? It's mm. like, you know, when I was a kid, I, I laughed at jokes about gay people when I heard them on TV. Mm. But first time I met a gay person, my, my thought wasn't, oh, this is one of those people I laughed at, good, I must now be mean to them. It was like, oh, this is a person I should be... Yeah. respectful to them as I yeah. try to be to everyone you know so I think it's it's a I think you know there's a lot more going on than that yeah. and I think actually people sometimes do themselves down by saying that because you're giving them an excuse do you think that uh, actually when comedians are making these kind of lady boy uh, cock jokes that they're not really connecting that with um, the reality of trans people which they're probably aware of and probably quite sensitive to I think probably a lot of the time you know once again generalizing is always a bit tricky because there might be some people out there who genuinely have a, a, a dislike or fear mm-hmm. of transgender people or bad experience or, and, and want to be mean. Yeah. I don't think, I, I've never met anyone, but you know, there might yeah. be some. I think overall there is an absolute, you're absolutely right, there's just a huge disconnect between what you say on stage or on TV where you are essentially playing a character. Mm-hmm. Even comedians, most comedians who are sort of themselves on stage, like I'm sort of myself on TV, but that isn't really me. Yeah. And that's why it always <laughs> amazes me when, when someone says, says, you're this or you're that, and you think, well, no, I'm not. And you think, oh, I realise I know. I am that because that's all I've allowed you to see of me or that's all I've yeah. presented of myself and I therefore have only myself to blame. Um, you know, I was talking about that book earlier, that book, The Man Who Is Magic, that I loved when I was a kid and there's yeah. a line in it, you are who you pretend to be so be careful who you pretend to be. Yeah. And that's so true, you know, because yeah. that's all you present to people and of course that's all they have to base their opinion on. Um, but I do think when they're, if someone was making a joke that made someone feel uncomfortable and that person was there, mm. most people I know who make jokes for a living would feel a little bit ashamed of themselves mm-hmm. and they and that would be a wake up call they would go oh I upset you I don't want to upset you you know and there's always a moment of awkwardness and so I, I, I think I mean you know if you're making it and sometimes jokes it is difficult because sometimes the joke uh, the subject is not the same as the target mm. so sometimes you might be mentioning a group of people or yeah. a type of person in the joke but the joke is about someone else dealing with it incorrectly yeah so you can't generalize and say no one should ever make a joke yeah. about that and i know you you feel that way mm. people aren't aware of other people's feelings enough when they're making mm. jokes and, and maybe they can't be yeah you know maybe they can't be 
you know, because if you were to run every joke that was written through a kind of, you know, about people or groups of society yeah. or attitudes towards it, then a lot of them you might think, okay, you can't say it, you can't say that. I don't know though, you know, I think back on my favourite comedians, and as I get older I think back, and I think even the ones who are quite old, the ones that I still look back on, I think that was a genuine talent, and people like Lenny Bruce or Steve Martin, who actually were, almost had the mindset of a very modern person today. Yeah. They weren't people trading in jokes, you know. And even the so-called insult comics back then, people like, you know, Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield wasn't like Bernard Manning. Mm. He wasn't making jokes about people because he made jokes about individuals or yeah. people who he'd met and there were kind of insults that were very well-crafted insults. Mm -hmm. Whereas Bernard Manning would do jokes about chinks or blacks or yeah. women or fat people. And that was the language that yeah. he used back then as well. And the audience were laughing with him and, they, and it did seem a little bit hateful. Do you think that jokes about transgender people become to seen in that same light? I think they will be. Yeah. I think because of the work you're doing, the work other people doing, I think they will be. I mean, there's that thing, once again, I'm playing footsie with you, oh. but once again, the uh, it's only because I've got really big feet uh, and pointed shoes. Once again, the um, uh, I think sometimes people say, when you make a joke, they say, would you, this seems to be a very uh, common thing right now when someone wants to point out something to someone and say, you, you've done something wrong. They say, would you be able to make that joke if you switch the word Muslim yeah. for Christian? If you switch the word black for tranny? Yeah. If you switch the word, you know, Asian for, you know, whatever? Yeah. And a lot of the time you couldn't. Yeah. Now, I don't know how useful that is because obviously sometimes, really? well, I, I think it's a, it's a useful first step. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether you can follow it always through to completion. Okay. Because I think sometimes you're making a joke about a different aspect of. Yeah. So You know what I mean? So it's like you can't necessarily, you know. I've heard people make jokes about eating and people eating too much. And yeah, okay, if I was really obese and I'm a little bit fat, but if I was really obese, that would upset me. But was it a joke aimed at me? No, it might have been a joke aimed at the food industry or it might have been a joke aimed at, you know, even sometimes the comedians are making jokes about themselves and their response to something. And you think, well, okay, so, so I don't think we can say you can't use any of these words. Mm. You know, I don't think you should not be able to use a word that even has, you know, like racial connotations the past, providing you're making a joke about the nature of that word. You yeah. know, so, so I don't think there can be, basically, there can't be hard, sorry, there can't be hard and fast rules. Mm. But I think really, you know, and, and also it's got to be down to the individual. Yeah. See, I, I'm all for some sort of biodiversity out there. I think there should be different voices expressing different opinions. Yeah. And it might be an opinion that many of us find very, very objectionable. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be voiced. Yeah. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be out there. Because it might well serve as a rallying cry for people to oppose it. It might actually be a good thing in some ways, even though it's not intended as a good thing. Uh, you know, basically I'm just opposed to any sort of censorship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would rather that we have someone who can go out there and they can talk about, you know, the most awful subjects, mm. glowingly if they wish, mm. because I do have faith that society as a whole is good. Yeah. And society as a whole will respond to that in the correct way by saying, no, that's repulsive. Yeah. You can't carry on. But I think the position that you, you might find yourself at with your work at the moment is that people haven't quite come round to regarding uh, transgender issues and transgender people as having the voice and having the kind of rights that maybe they should have. I think yeah. when he's pointed out to them, they immediately get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but they don't totally. really want to hear it. Also, you know, it spoils your fun. Yeah, and yeah. You come to me and say you can't make those jokes anymore. Yeah. By forcing me to acknowledge that, oh man, that's okay. I can't go there then. Yeah, yeah. You know, and as you know, it wasn't the kind of when I made the joke, it wasn't an arbitrary. Let's make a joke about trans this week. There was a yeah. news story that week, and then we yeah. chose to go that particular route. You know, but now there's a new story. See, literally 10, 15 years ago, I'd have fucking been over the moon there was a story about a tranny. Yeah. Uh, either transsexual or just transvestite. Yeah. And transvestite still, I guess we can kind of still go there a bit. Yeah. But you'd sit and go, good, because I know most of my audience are not and will not have encountered a transgender person. Yeah, I think, really though? Do you think Do you think that's what it is? I think that's part of it. That's why it's easier to go, okay, we're all this, uh, like, hit, hit, okay, let's use that thing I said earlier that maybe we shouldn't use. Yeah. Say you wanted to make a joke about black people. Yeah. If you're making an audience in which 50% of them are black, you're going to think twice. Yeah. If you're making fun of an audience in which 97% of them are white, yeah. you're going to think, well, we'll probably get away with this. Yeah. And that's the way it's been. Yeah. And, and, and what's interesting is that it's changed, not because suddenly the audience has become 50-50 or people are more aware of uh, the black facing audience, because they realise that's not okay. Yeah. Okay? So I think it used to be in an audience, they're probably, well, I mean, you know, I don't know how many, I mean, once again, I hadn't met a transgender person until I went to America and made a documentary series years ago and we were interviewing someone about mm. their experiences. Mm. And then now, back in the UK, and then I met uh, Roz and I met this other person who I actually can't stand, and I met you. Uh, you know, so I know a few more now, but I don't know that many. And my daughter, as you know, she's gay, so she comes up and talks a lot about 
I'm not sure the word is it LBGTQ or LGBTQ? LGBTQI. Oh, lots of they different. They keep adding to it as well. They do, yeah. It's ridiculous. Now. I find it quite hard to keep up. Unfortunately, I don't really have to. So, um, those issues. So, I'm more aware of it now yeah. than ever before. But I think um, it's still something which is, you know, still not quite out there in everyone's head. I mean, like everyone accepts gay people. Yeah. Everyone accepts gay pride. Mm-hmm. Everyone accepts that you can't be uh, homophobic. Yeah. Transphobic is still kind of is not a word that most people have heard. Yeah. You know, so even just on that level, I think you can see, okay, well, then it isn't a level playing field yet. Yeah. And that, of course, would make it easier to make jokes because it isn't, you know. You've... Well, what I wanted to ask, actually, is how do we get trans people into the media and actually getting their voices out there? Because it wouldn't be so bad if, you know, we had these little jokes and stuff, if somebody could flick over and see a trans person presenting the news in the way that we see well, Muslim people presenting it, the news, It would be step by step. If you look at gay... Let's look at this because it's a very easy paradox, mate, but if you look at kind of like gay rights and the gay movement... When you, when I was first on TV, I don't think there were many gay hosts of people, but I was aware of quite a lot of gay comedians out there. You know, there was Simon Fanshawe, then Norton came on the scene, and Graham, there were a few other people. And Fanshawe was doing a lot of work in the clubs where he was going out and sometimes getting heckled for it, but basically going, yeah, I'm gay, get over it. Mm. My humour isn't about being gay solely, but there will be some jokes. And then Norton came on TV, and Graham very early on, very much embraced his sexuality in a very open way and he would mm-hmm. go on stage I saw him do better he'd go and say hello it's me Graham Norton that puff off the telly and that was a good joke because people were like okay well he's mentioned it and he's okay about it mm-hmm. and he's made a little joke about it it's cool we can yeah. so when you get someone coming out I imagine as soon as you get you know one or two breakthrough acts either as comedians or performers or or TV hosts or whatever who come in and go yeah I'm trans okay okay we've dealt with that good fine let's move on now let's do the job mm-hmm. and the job is done well you yeah. know they are still funny or yeah. they are still just competent and slick or whatever, then that, that will be the turning point probably. And that will become when it's like, it will gradually be less of an issue. So it's no longer a novelty. I mean, it isn't a novelty seeing someone who's clearly a gay man or woman on TV anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, it isn't really a novelty. I mean, it probably maybe they don't feel as represented as they might be, but it isn't, you don't try to think, that person gay? Mm-hmm. Wow, there's a gay person doing, I think that guy's gay. Now it's like, oh, you know, he's probably gay. Yeah. It's not an issue. I mean, the thing about trans though, and you would know about me is, uh, unless you are, uh, uh, you took, you gave me a new word last time, but stealth. Yeah. Living stealth. I imagine in a way though, you, you certainly you wouldn't want to be known, just like you wouldn't want to be known as the gay comedian. Yeah. You wouldn't want to be known as the trans comedian. Yeah. You wouldn't want to be known as the trans presenter. But I imagine the first few people who, who break through yeah. will be. Or have to be politically, you know, yeah, definitely. And in a way, they'll be the ones who have to do that to actually open the gate, gates yeah. and, and, and make it okay for others to follow, I guess. But that's probably what would happen, I imagine. There'll mm. be, you know, a couple of breakthrough acts or a couple of breakthrough people, and oh, I see, and they will be, and they will be wheeled out every time there's a discussion. Yeah. Like that. And they will be called, like I'm sure you're always called. We need someone who can talk about it, who's articulate and will d- deal with the issue and isn't mental, yeah. but we can get in. And and but then it will calm down. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think a lot of these comedians making um, jokes about trans people realise how um, tired and kind of just not very imaginative these jokes are they're not they're not savvy we're not really seeing any intelligent jokes about the gender are we it's weird though because it depends where you're looking you know if you're looking mainstream and where I kind of have set my stall out now it's very mainstream especially now I'm on ITV you know in a way it's even more of a, a broad audience than it was back on BBC One even though it was a kind of a, a broad based show then you you don't want to be too clever because mm. you don't want to exclude people I mean the bigger yeah. the crowd you're playing for yeah the more inclusive that you desire to be, therefore the less kind of um, uh, kind of excluding the material must be. So mm. it can't be too clever, it can't be too cutting edge or too modern. Mm. And and therefore the danger then is to reach for things like mm. something which you know might be a bit of a kind of a bald, older topic, like so you mm. can do a joke about cocks and balls. Mm. You know, I mean a lot of the stuff I do on the show is a kind of double entendre and I, I, I don't think so. It's weird, sometimes it's based on just awkwardness or me being acting as if I'm sort of really arrogant and really, but but really the joke is I'm not any good. You know what I mean? It's kind of, it doesn't really bear analysis too much, but it's like you're going, you know, I used to say on the show, as I said, I'm the only known cure for lesbianism. Right? Now, clearly that's a joke based on the fact that, that I'm being an ass. Yeah. That's what I thought. I thought it was clear to people that obviously I'm not saying there's a cure for lesbianism, yeah. nor do I genuinely think I'm particularly attractive. 
saying it, you're actually creating yourself as a kind of overblown, arrogant fool. Yeah. But then someone years later, when my daughter came out and said, well, how would you like it now? If someone said that, I wouldn't care less because it's a joke based on him being an idiot. Yeah. The joke there was me being an idiot. The joke yeah. wasn't me saying lesbians can somehow or should somehow there is a kind of, there's a need for a cure for something which isn't an illness you know the joke really was i'm an ass yeah you know so sometimes people maybe don't pick up on that and yeah. they still i would still defend their right to be offended by that yeah. Yeah. but i would think they would listen a bit closer and say actually you know what he's not making a joke and i can understand that maybe even putting it in the conversation in that way would annoy someone mm. because they've had to put up with shit maybe that yeah, i'm yeah. not aware of so yeah. you kind of have to be sensitive about that but at the same time you have to I think as long as you feel you can justify it to yourself yeah. after the event, or as long as you can look someone in the eye who was upset by it yeah. and say, okay, I'm sorry you're upset, and you know, you should always be sorry if someone's upset, even if you don't think they've got a case. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. But I would say, I'm sorry you're upset, but this is what I said and this is what I meant by it. And if you can't justify that, then maybe you shouldn't make it. Mm. And I think more and more people are coming around to that. Mm. And I, me- I remember when we had the conversation about the jokes I made, and I, said, and I said to you, and you said, I appreciate your candor there, because I said, you kind of know when you're making those jokes that you shouldn't. Mm. And I think people do. Yeah. I think people do know when they're making a joke that they shouldn't really make, but it's an easy, cheap shot, and they're going to get a laugh, so then coast along to the next one, you know. Mm. And the more you produce a volume of work, and the more, mm. you, then the, the easier it is to reach for that, you know. Mm. I mean, when someone's on, you know, occasionally people get up in arms about, well, Graham's been in trouble a couple of times, and Chris Miles is often in trouble for saying something, and you think, well, part of the reason why he's in trouble is, and I kind of, I don't know either of them very well, but, I know them a little bit. One reason is because you're doing so much stuff and you're feeling so much airtime. Yeah. You know, like Graham used to be on, he was on five nights a week on Channel 4 once. Miles is on every five mornings. Because you're feeling that much airtime and you're trying to get, there will be a day when one morning here, one morning there, one evening here, one evening there, where your mind isn't quite on it, you're not quite with it, and you reach for the easy laugh or you reach for something you've said before and you put a slightly edgy spin on it that you did before. And suddenly, what might have seemed okay that day, when you were presenting it differently, or it was responding to a different stimuli, now it's coming out as just nasty. Yeah, do you think there's actually um, a culture of nastiness which is kind of seeping into the media? Because I'd argue that there is, but maybe that's I would a argue negative. there was, and mm. I think now people are moving away from that. Really? Yeah, and I think part, I would argue that, and I think partly because, um, because of the sort of like trouble we're all in globally. Yeah. I think everyone's been forced to stop and consider their fellow human beings a little bit more than they were. Yeah. You know, when you're riding high and everyone seems to be going, everyone's got enough money, and of course, there's never a time when everyone's got enough money, mm. but it feels that way. Mm. When, you're, when, when unemployment is in the news every day, mm. and when the recession is in the news every day, when you don't see countries getting tits up elsewhere, and fuck those poor guys, you know, there are people there who, who look like us mm. in a line for free soup in Greece. Mm. That's not good. Mm. You know, then you're forced to stop thinking, and I think you do think, okay, well, I, I, I don't want to add to the, yeah. the kind of negativity out there and I do think people are more aware and you know once again you know the whole thing that happened with me the sax thing, even though it was weird and it was a bit overblown and overcooked by the media at the same time they had a point mm-hmm. and it wasn't a nice thing to say it wasn't a nice thing to do it was thoughtless and it was crass and to be upbraided over that was probably right how would you feel if one of your children turned around and said that they were transgender how would that feel how do you think you'd react I'd probably be I'd probably be well I'd probably be worried in that I would worry about two things initially. One is, interestingly, I would worry about the reaction that got outside. Yeah. Which I would no longer be worried, and, and I could speak from first-hand experience to this, one of them came home and said they're gay. Yeah. Because I wasn't worried about it because I didn't think that the world was going to be hostile. I think your first reaction to children is wanting to protect them, and so if that had been the case, I thought, oh my God, you know, and I'm sure, my, I, don't know, I can't say I'm sure, but perhaps the reason some parents react um, with fear or alarm when a child comes out to them is because they're worried about how the world's going to treat them, you know, maybe. Uh, and I think if one of my kids comes out and was trans and, and, and certainly wanted to go through the kind of surgery of organisations, I would worry about that as well. Yeah. You would worry about anyone going through surgical procedures in the same way that, you know, you don't want anyone to have to have surgery for anything if they're lucky enough to avoid it, you know, and you always, there's always concern about that. But once again, because of my comparative ignorance as to the actual process and the success and the and whether or not they're ever really at the position they want to be, yeah. I would worry about that side as well. But I guess that together you would go on that journey of discovery and education. Mm. You know, I mean, it wouldn't be something that would. I mean, it would. It would. It would be of more concern to me than than when my daughter came out and said she was gay. Yeah. You know, but I wouldn't. You know, like my son came up and said he was gay. It wouldn't bother me. But if he came up and said, "Look, Dad, I am trans and I want to become a woman physically mm. as well," 
that would be it would be a bigger thing to deal with and I suppose also because it's going to have a bigger impact on all your lives yeah because you know that they're going to have to go through periods of recovery and adjustment yeah. and change and so it would perhaps be a bigger issue but it certainly wouldn't be an issue that would maybe change my feelings towards them mm. you know and how was the reaction with Betty it is Betty isn't it yeah yeah well my, my just Great, good. You know. well, I mean, in terms of press and stuff. Oh, press, it was kind of, well, it became a story which I wish I hadn't. And, I, you know, I didn't. Here's the weird thing is, I was doing a chat on Gaydar Radio, and I can't remember what I was doing. I think they just got me on Twitter and they said, Oh, we're doing this thing, do you want to have a chat? And I said, Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've often I've done things, I did something with BBC Sheffield a while ago, so they got me on Twitter and said, Do you want to? Okay. Yeah. Um, and they, one of the questions was, How would you feel if one of your kids, someone said, Well, they want to know how would you feel if one of your kids, just the question just asked me. And of course it just happened like a few months before and I thought well I don't want to pretend it hasn't happened yeah. because if, even if I'm elusive about it or evasive yeah if it then comes out she is yeah people might think that I had a problem with it yeah which would then reflect on her and make her uncomfortable yeah so I thought well yeah I, you know so I have to say well it's happened so yeah. and it wasn't an issue and of course then it looked like I was outing her on air yeah. which because I wasn't because she was yeah. already out to her you know all her friends and stuff but um the reaction was, I mean, it was a kind of quite a big story for a week or so, I guess. A couple, it was very weird, but a lot of it is a, a reflection back on the way people perceive you. A couple of people said, oh, that's Ross trying to get attention for himself. And mm -hmm. you think, that's just odd, but I could kind of see why they might think yeah. that. But it's an odd odd reaction, because it, it wasn't the case. Um, but it was, I mean, I was worried on skin, I was worried about her. I didn't want her to have her life infringed on anyway and there were photographers went down and tried to get pictures of it and, yeah, that's not fair mm. but you know just by talking about something shouldn't mean that it's fair game mm. so I was I was worried about that side of things but really it was fine it blew over fairly quickly and she I think she liked some of the benefits because she then got invited up to Manchester Pride right. that she wasn't going to go to okay. and so she got tickets to a couple of things out of it so there was some good but that's you know being a sort of famous guy I suppose but really in the long term I don't think it, 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 it was an issue you know okay there are a lot of there are trans politicians and public officials around the world and I think television presenters and, and all sorts of things why do you think there isn't anybody in the UK there's, there's, there's no one is there really yeah. apart from David Cameron of course uh, have you, you didn't got, know about that uh, <laughs> Are you, are you accusing the Prime Minister of being a secret cross-dresser, oh, Jonathan? I would, I would like to think he accusing. got... Accusing. I would like to think he got up to something interesting in his spare time because he's very dull the rest yeah. of the time. Um, I don't know whether it's... But, you know, once, once again, if you look at the kind of the analogy with gay rights, right? Peter Tatchell was a very outspoken figure earlier and he was seen by many as being, early on, as being an irritant, as being... Um, unnecessarily vocal about something that he shouldn't have been as being aggressively pro -gay. and he, I think he was seen maybe I'm wrong but I think he was seen as being not a joke exactly but he wasn't seen as being a force for good necessarily mm -hmm. early on he was seen as being a bit of an extremist now I think the consensus is what an incredible man yeah what an incredible man for going out there and shouting when people didn't want to listen mm -hmm. and for putting himself on the line and being that involved and, and enduring that level of kind of hostility and grief for a cause he believed in. And now he's canonised now, but now he's certainly very, very widely respected, I think. I think mm -hmm. if someone's to come out and speak out against him, they better have their facts right, because everyone's yeah. going to go, hold on, you're talking about somebody who's really mm -hmm. fucking changed things with the way he's lived his life and made a difference. Um, and I suspect that we will see, and maybe it'll be you, Paris, I don't know. I, I, this is a good point to wrap up on because I really admire Peter Tatchell and I guess to kind of finish I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to know who who do you look up to and who do you admire I do admire people who, who get involved and put themselves on the line I mean if you are talking about famous people that's easier to reach for I do admire for example Martin Sheen I admire George Clooney I admire Tina Fey mm -hmm. I admire people who actually use their position for good I admire Michael Moore yeah you know we're talking about all media figures there I admire people who actually use their position and say, okay, you know, um, we are going to use the position of uh, influence we have. Mm. Or, uh, you know, I admire Brad and Angelina, mm. even though th that, that's a strange thing in some ways. But, you know, they went out there and they had their baby in Africa. Yeah. And by doing that, they helped show the world, hold on, do not look at these people as being primitive or somehow less capable <laughs> as us. You know, we could go anywhere in the world and we didn't go to LA. We didn't go to Harley Street. We went to this, um, and we sold the story rights, and we gave the money back to them so they could build a road to the hospital. That's an incredible thing to do. You know, they 
fundamentally change people's lives. You know, I admire people, I suppose, who, who, who have an opinion or have a belief and they, they stick to it and they, you know, I admire you, Paris, because you do, you know, you give a lot of your time and your energy and, and you know, and I know it, ca- you know, you care a lot and you go out there and you try and change things and that's it. People try and change things for the better. I admire them.